back and forth. But certainly, you didn't know that, so there's no reason to apologize. Um, we'll take that question. I'm going to just wait on it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Ben. Um, uh, no, I got it. I just thought I didn't know what Okay. Um, homework five. Any takers? Ava. Ten, certainly. So, looking at number 10, at first glance, um, I notice right away that it's But if I look a little bit closer, it's okay because each term has at least n squared in it, so I can factor it off to make it quadratic. No big deal. Uh, if I further, though, look at the coefficients, I notice that everything has got a multiple of, everything is a multiple of 4. So I begin by taking out 4n squared. And while I still end up with a problem with, that I have to do with the long factoring, the numbers are a little bit more convenient because they're a little bit smaller. It makes that search space for finding our two numbers a little bit easier. So I need to find the two numbers that multiply to give me 7 times negative 20. And then add to give us 4. So that's 14 and negative 10. Okay there. So 7n squared plus 14n plus a negative 10n minus 20. Now remember when I write these, I always have to make sure there's a plus sign in between my two groups. That's why I wrote it as plus a negative 10 rather than minus 10. Um, so now I can, from the first group, I can take out a 7n, leaving with n plus 2. From the second group, I can take out a negative 10 leaving me with an n plus 2. And since I have an n plus 2 in common, I can factor that out as 10. And that's my final answer there. Uh, I, out. I never really touched it again. It just kind of stayed out front the whole way. It never combined with anything else. It never got distributed. Once I pulled it out, it just stayed out, and it sits out there in front for the entirety of the problem. Ava, are you happy with that? Okay. Uh, Stefan. Uh, where did we get the four numbers? Uh, the two numbers that multiplied to give me negative 140 and added to give me 4. So where did the negative 140 come from? A times C. So 7 okay. times negative 20. No problem. Though these are important questions that, again, like if you need clarification, reminder on stuff, that's perfectly cool. That's what this is for. Stefan? Uh, so you need an A times C in the secondary, like, secondary line of the problem, not the original. Correct. I mean, you could start with the original and you'll get the same, you'd get the same, you'd be able to find two numbers there. Uh -huh. But I always are going to, I'm always going to take a look at the factored form, or if I can take anything out. Yeah. If the numbers are smaller afterwards, use the smaller numbers. It makes the search space way smaller and way easier to find the two numbers. You know, if you were looking for, you know, whatever that would have been, it was it was big. Yeah. Uh, yes, Evan. That's that's just the B. Yep. So this one is A times C, and this one is B. Ben. Uh, can you do 15? Sure. Okay. So again, at first glance, you look at this and you're like, oh dear, we got two variables in here. But that's not a big deal because you notice that the R is on each term, so we can just factor that off. If I look at the coefficients, 9, 73, and 70, there's no factor in common to all of them. So all I can do is take out that R. And then I'm going to find the two numbers that multiply to give me 630. That's 9 times 70. And add to give me 73. Well, I see the two numbers. They're 63 and 10. So I can rewrite this as 9P squared plus 63P plus 10p plus 70.
I'll make my two groups. From the first group, I can take out a 9p. From the second group, I can take out a 10. Yes. And then I notice that both of these have a p plus 7 in common. So if I take that out, I'm left with 9p plus 10. And there's my final answer. Sure, no problem, my man. Sure. Um, number, three. number three. Okay. Oh, actually, number six. Okay. Oh, I love six. So notice the C term, right? Yeah. So that makes life immensely easier. So all I need to do is look for a greatest common factor. That's K. That's it. That's it. That's it. Okay. As much as we can do. If there is no C term, multiplies to give a zero is zero in anything, right? So it doesn't really help us a lot. So I don't have to do anything with that. I just look for a greatest common factor and I'm done. So it's always easier when there's either no B term or no C term. Those are easier problems. So you have to do less. They become much, much, much simpler. So those are good things. Uh, anybody else before we move on to homework six? Evan? 13. Okay. So right away, I noticed two variables, but again, it's no big deal, just like on 15, because we have Bs and everything, so I can just take the B out. If I look at the coefficients, 30, 87, and 30, I notice that all of them are divisible by 3. So I'm going to take out a 3B. So now I need to find the two numbers that multiply to give me positive 100 and add to give me negative 29. Those are negative 25 and negative 4. So I have 3b squared times 10n squared minus 25n plus a negative 4n plus 10. And I'll make my two groups. From the first group, I can take out a 5n. From the second group, I can take out a negative 2. And then I notice that I have a 2n minus 5 in common to both. So when I take that out, it leaves me with 5n minus 2. Ava. So you'll notice that from this, the only thing that changed was the negative twenty nine. So all of that stuff stayed the same, right? And I replaced the negative 29 with negative 25 plus negative 4. So that's how I use those two numbers to write that. So it just replaces the B term into two chunks. Okay, Evan? Yes. So 
so those are those are the greatest common factors so moving from that line to the next line the 5n is there and the negative 2 is there okay so again this process is a little bit more complicated right so it takes a little bit more practice and that's okay we'll continue to practice on this Ben sure it's okay for me to scroll okay so this one's easier because the leading coefficient here is one so I just need to find two numbers that multiply to give us eight and add to give us negative nine well that's negative eight negative one and I can go straight to the factored form with that one I don't have to do anything fancy there just all shortcut Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Sometimes those ones where we're using one are sometimes the least obvious. What are the two numbers here? Yeah. Um, again, if you don't see it right away, make a list. You know, just list out all the factors. And oftentimes you're like, oh, yeah, there is one. There it is. Mr. Bullock? Yes. Can you, can you do number five? Sure. I missed who was talking to me. It's Hallie. Oh, hi, Hallie. Hello. Okay, number five. Okay, so again, um, we'd look for a greatest common factor, but there's nothing in common between 7, 31, and 20. So we're just going to start with looking for two numbers that multiply to give us 7 times negative 20. So that's going to be negative 35 and 4 are the two numbers. And sometimes that itself, they're the hardest part. So I'm going to use those two numbers to rewrite the original problem, but with instead of the negative 31, I'll have negative 35 plus 4. Make my two groups. From the first group, I can take out x. Yes, sir? So no matter what, the same. Yeah, so the two numbers right. have to be um, the... Yes, has to be the same two numbers for both questions. Right. Yes. And then I can take a 4 out of 4x minus 20. So each of them have an x minus 5. So when I take out the x minus 5, what's left is x, 7x, excuse me, plus 4. Allie, are you good with that? Yeah, thank you. Of course. Should we move on to homework six? Are we ready? Yeah. We've done a bunch from here. Again, I'm happy to do a bunch. No break, no big deal. So, Evan, you said you had a question from uh, number, nine. number nine, okay? So, on number nine, or actually on this whole sheet, it asks us to solve by factoring. So, if I'm going to use factoring as my solving technique, I'm going to need to use the zero product property. So, my first step is always going to be to make sure that the equation is equal to zero. Right now, my equation is not equal to zero. So I'm going to begin by making it equal 0. So I'm going to add 3v squared to both sides and then subtract 6v from both sides. Okay. 
So now it's equal to zero. Evan, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. So now I need to find two numbers that multiply to, or this is a shortcut situation since the leading coefficient is one. So we can do this easily by finding two numbers that multiply to give me positive 12 and add to give me negative seven. So that would be negative three and negative four. Are you okay there? Okay. And then using the zero product property, I can split those and say they're each equal to zero and solve each of them independently. So if I add three to both sides, I get v equals three. If I add four to both sides, I get v equals four. And those are my answers. So once we've done the factoring step, there's not much more to do after that, right? It's just solving some easy pre-algebra type problem. But still got to make sure that we do that part. Ben. Sure. Sure. So I added it. I added 3v squared to both sides. So when I added positive 3v squared, negative 3v squared, we just get zero. Right? So my first step when I'm solving any of these is it's got to equal zero. So got to make it equal zero. Okay, um, so we'll do the same thing here to start, Ben. We'll start by subtracting 7x squared from both sides and adding 8 to both sides. And there is no greatest common factor here, which is lovely. So I need the two numbers that multiply to give me 980 and add to give me negative 69. Oh, let's see. Well, let's see. We have 10 and 98. Well, negative 98, but that's going to be too big, right? So we should be getting closer, these numbers closer together. So 11 doesn't work, 12 doesn't work. And I have 14 and negative 70. And now that's too small. So I don't think there are two numbers. I don't think this is factorable. Let's check this real quick. Oh, no, that this does work. Thank you. 
Okay. Oh my goodness, I'm so stupid. Well, they're both got to be negative. I don't know what I'm doing here, right? So you want them very close together, not so far apart. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. There they are. Negative 20 and negative 49. Goodness gracious. I feel like a Duma. Okay. Uh, so from the first factor, I can take out a 5x. Give me a 7x minus 4. When I can take out a negative 7, and leave me with 7x, or I'm sorry, minus 4. So 7x minus 4 comes out. That leaves me with 5x minus 7. And then if I set each of these equal to 0, I add 4 and then divide by 7. And then I add 7 and divide by 5. So those are my two answers. Is that a 7 on the 1, 5, right? 7 over 5? 7 over 5? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So finding the two numbers there is a kind of a doozy. Took a minute, but we found them. So do you see the entire problem where numbers are uh, For now, you could say that. We're going to eventually plug that hole, though, with some new fact or new solving techniques so that we're able to now solve anything, but we're not quite there yet. So eventually, all of these are going to have answers. Okay. But right now, it's not I think all of these ones work, okay. just FYI. I was surprised that this one wasn't working, but it was because I was being dumb and not because there was actually a problem. So I think all of these do work. I mean, there's, it's always possible that there's a mistake or whatever, but I think that they all work. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, any more? Questions on homework six? Again, basically the same thing as homework five, right? We just have a, some additional solving at the end, but the solving is pretty easy once you've got it factored. The factoring is usually the hang up. Okay? So if you guys would do me a favor, we're gonna do some other timed factoring practice here. So if you make a spot on your desk, you'll probably need something to write with, and you can use your calculator if you want, but you don't need your calculator to do this problem. But you're welcome to use one if you are used to doing that. So I'm going to pass, pass these out, leave them face down until I tell you it's time to go. That's okay. Amazing. Have we done this one? What number six or something on this? Still trying to figure them out. So here's the deal with these ones. Some of them can be done with the shortcuts. But not all. So some of them you're gonna have to do the long way that we were doing in this last night homework. And some of them may not be factorable at all. So you're going to have to be a little bit careful here. 
So some of them you can use the shortcut on, but not all. Some of them you're going to have to do that long way that we've been, or that we've just done in the homeworks here. Some of them might not be factorable at all, so you have to also be on the lookout for those. Um, those of you that are working at home, we're looking at the factoring practice six, the time factoring practice six in the content library if you want to follow along. We're going to work on this for about five minutes. If you are at home and you're having technology issues, you can always do it on your own later and time yourself. It's no big deal. Um, it's just for practice. Those of you that are here, are we ready to go? On your mark, get set, begin! Five minutes.
Okay, so just a couple seconds remaining. And pencils down. Okay, uh, completion check, quick show of hands. At least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Let's uh, check them here. So here's the first few. I'll scroll here in a minute. Is that uh, the second one? Is that a nine as well? Yep. The first six should have been pretty easy to do. They were all ones that could have been done pretty quickly. They're all shortcut eligible. Got a little bit harder, seven through 10, but still seven and nine, you could have used your shortcuts on. Did you factor eight? Yeah. Why isn't it factorable? Because it's got a plus and not a minus. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, sneaky, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a little correctness check here. So at least one correct. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten. So by and large, it looks like the ones that we finished were more or less correct. We might have had missed yeah. one or two in there, but overall, we're doing pretty good on the accuracy end, right? Is that fair? Yeah, so that's good. So again, these ones were, there's some in here that were a little bit harder. Ten would have taken a little bit of time, for sure. And if you ran out of time doing ten, that's okay. Um, but five minutes to do 10 problems is, that's pretty quick, right? Especially when there's some stuff in here that maybe wasn't factorable that we wasted time on, or ones like 10 where it, there was no shortcut through it. It was, you just literally had to go the long way through it. Um, we'll continue to do these little time practices throughout the chapter, just kind of never getting too far away from any of these skills. Um, as we continue to add factoring skills like we've done, I'll continue to make these ones, you know, a little bit more diverse. So they'll have ones that can be done with short with a variety of the shortcuts, some that may not be factorable at all, some that might need to be doing, um, have to be done the long way. But we'll kind of continue to do some of these time practices as we go. We just have one today. Um, okay. But we'll continue to kind of come back to this every once in a while in this chapter. So today, now we're going to continue where we left off talking about solving. So to this point, we've handled situations where if we have a factored form equal to zero, we can solve that, right? That's relatively easy for us. And we've done situations like this, where if we have a standard form polynomial 
and we can get it into factored form, we can solve that situation also, right? Those are the two solving situations that we've taken care of so far. The issue is, We don't have factoring techniques that allow us to easily factor everything, right? That's one of the things that we're going to start working on remedying today. Okay with that plan? So just kind of recapping what we've done so far and what the catch is or what the, what the incomplete part of our the methods that we've developed so far that we're going to work on kind of filling in those gaps. Okay. So today, we're going to work on these situations where we have a standard form equation, but the B coefficient is equal to zero. So let's look at some examples on what that looks like and how to deal with it. So let's say that we have this situation, 4x squared minus 7 is equal to 0. Notice here that there is no regular x term, right? The reason there's no regular x term is because the b coefficient is basically 0. Everybody's okay with that idea? This is an easy situation for us to deal with. We don't have to do any factoring. We don't have to do anything fancy. We can just apply the standard reverse order of operations that we would use to solve any kind of problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo any addition or subtraction going on by adding 7 to both sides of our equation. Next, I'm going to undo both sides of our equation by 4. Now I'll undo any exponents. How do I undo a squared exponent? What's going to cancel out a squared? Well, a square root, right? Everybody's okay with that? So I will square root both sides of my equation. But we're going to pause here and just make a little aside because there's some facts about square roots that we may not have remember from our Algebra 1 class, so let's make sure that we address these before we get going too much further here. So if we square root both sides of an equation, it makes a plus or minus. The square root of a fraction, we can just think of as the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. Or similarly with a product, the square root of a product, Those things are all good. What's bad, what you cannot do, is 
break a square root at an addition or subtraction symbol. That's not okay. There's nothing you can do to simplify addition or subtraction under a square root. Okay with that? Okay. So again, you might have remembered those from your Algebra 1 class, or maybe you never saw them or you don't or you've forgotten. Who knows? But important things to kind of remember while we deal with some square roots here for a little bit. Okay. So returning to our original problem, since I square rooted the x squared, I'm left with just x. Because I square root both sides of the equation, I have a plus or minus. And because I have the square root of a fraction, I can write it as the square root of 7 over the square root of 4. So far, so good? Okay. I notice that I have the square root of 4 in the denominator. The square root of 4 is just 2. So I'll simplify that. which leaves me with my final answer, plus or minus the square root of 7 over 2. Are we okay there? All right, let's do another. Okay, what if we have 5x squared minus 13 equals 6? Does it matter that this doesn't equal 0? Do I need to worry about that here? No, because I'm not going to factor. I'm not using the zero product property, so I don't care that it doesn't equal 0. That's not a big deal. I'm just going to start by the same way I did before undoing any addition or subtraction. That gives me this. Next, I'll undo any multiplication or division. So I'll divide both sides by 5. That gives me this. Then we'll square root both sides. So the square root of x squared just gives me x. Because I square rooted both sides, I get a plus or minus. And because I have the square root of a fraction, I'm going to just write the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. Now, remember back last year in your geometry course when you did sine cosine and tangent stuff towards the end of the year you ran into situations where occasionally you had a square root in the denominator of a fraction remember that we did not want to leave our final answers that way right do you remember what you did back then to fix that that's okay all we need to do is we're just going to multiply the numerator and denominator, whatever that square root is that's in the denominator. So the square root of 19 times the square root of 5 is the square root of 19 times 5, which is 95. And the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 is the square root of 25. And the square root of 25 is just 5. And no more square root in our denominator. Now notice here that this is still the same answer as the square root of 19 over 5. If I type these two into my calculator and got the decimal, it's going to be the exact same decimal. Because all we really did is we multiplied by 1, right? 
square root of five over square root of five is just one. So all I did was multiply this by one. So I didn't change the value of anything. I just changed the way it looks like. Both answers are correct. Just one answer is the form that we've agreed to report our answers in, and the other is not. Remember when you dealt with fractions way back in elementary school? At some point along the way, we decided that we're gonna always represent our fractions as reduced fractions. So you didn't write down 5 tenths anymore. You wrote down one half. Even though they're still the same number, we agreed that we we're just going to write reduced fractions instead of non-reduced fractions. The same idea here. Everybody okay with this process? Pretty easy in general, right? Very familiar feeling. It's basically the same procedure that we used um, to solve linear equations way back in our Algebra 1 class or even our pre-algebra classes. Well, we can apply this same process to other situations. So what if we have a situation like this? This looks like vertex form to me, right? Everybody's okay with that? Now it doesn't equal zero, but that's fine. Because we're not going to use factoring to solve this. We're going to use the same process we used before. So my first step is to undo any addition or subtraction. So I'll add 10 to both sides. Now I can't, I can't undo the that's inside the parentheses right now because it's inside the parentheses. In order for me to get at that plus 3 to undo it, I would need to get rid of the 2 out front and the squared on the parentheses. So I can't get rid of that yet, but I will after I've done those other things. So next up is to divide by 2 to both sides. And then we'll And now that I've cleared every all the parentheses out, now I can get rid of the minus 3, or the plus 3, by subtracting 3 from both sides. Can't combine a number that's under a square root with a number that's not under the square root. Those aren't like terms, so they don't go combine together. So all I'm going to do is write it this way. And I can do a little bit better simplifying this than this. The place where I can do a little bit better is with this square root of 8. I notice that the square root of 8 is the same thing as 4 times the square root of 2. Right? The square root of 8 is 4 times 2. Or 8 is 4 times 2. So the square root of 8 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. Why would I want to do that? Well, what's the square root of 4? It's 2. So that just simplifies my radical a little bit. Is everybody okay with that? This is the key that we needed. So let's put this idea together. So we have any standard form quadratic. I can always turn into a vertex form quadratic by completing the square, right? That's always possible. We can always do that. And if we have a quadratic form polynomial, we can always solve that 
using the method that we've just done above, right? So let's do an example of doing that then. So let's say we have x squared plus 5x minus, uh, I changed my mind. Let's make that 6x minus 3. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the completing the square process to rewrite this so that it's in vertex form. Remember the first step in completing the square is to make sure the leading coefficient is 1. Well, it is, so I don't have to do anything there. The next step is going to be to take that b term, divide it by 2, square it, and then I'm going to add and subtract it. So 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9, and then I'm going to subtract the 9 right away. So it's like I've done nothing at all. But what that allows me to do is factor this part. So the two things that multiply to give me 9 and add to give me 6 are 3 and 3. Negative 9 minus 3 is negative 12. And then x plus 3 times x plus 3 I can just write as x plus 3 squared. And now I'm in business, right? Now I'm back to where I was before. So I can start my solving process. So I'll add 3 to both, or add 12 to both. There's no multiplication to undo. So I can skip doing that and just go straight to square rooting both sides. And then I just need to subtract 3 from both sides itself. Notice that I can't negative 3 with the square root of 12, so I'm just going to write it next to each other. And I can do a little bit better than the square root of 12 because I remember that 12 is 4 times 3, and the square root of 4 is just 2. So there's my final answer. Now here's the thing. We can always do this completing the square. The steps are always the same. We can always do this solving algorithm once we have a, or a vertex form polynomial. Those steps are always the same. What we're going to do is we're going to take a very general instance and we're going to perform those same steps so we can generate a formula so we can skip having to do a completing the square and then that solving algorithm every time we want to do a problem like this. We can just take a look at the values and plug them into an equation and spit out the answer. Okay with that plan? So the process that I'm about to do, I would never ask you to repeat. I don't need you to remember how to do it. We're just going to use the formula once we generate it. But I think it's important that you see where the formula comes from. So you don't need to necessarily take notes on this. You can just kind of watch and you know, see what's happening. But I think it's helpful to realize that this formula that we're about to create is just a product of using techniques that we already know how to do, applied in a very general way. So here's our generalist situation, right? Here's a standard form polynomial. A, B, and C can be whatever they want. Well, A is not zero because it wouldn't be a quadratic anyway, but okay with that. We're going to start the completing the square process, so I'm going to factor off the A so that it, my leading coefficient is 1. Everybody's okay there. 
I'm then going to take that middle term, divide it by 2, square it, and then add and subtract it. So when I divide this by 2, I get b over 2a. And then I need to kick these last two guys. So I do that by distributing the a. And c over a times a is just c, then. So far, so good? Again, not necessary that you'd ever have to do this yourself. Uh, I'll factor this part. And then if I multiply this part out, I get that. And here the A is going to cancel with one of the A's there. And I'm going to make a common denominator here with the C. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of C by 4A over 4A. And actually, to do that, I would have to do that. Okay. So I'm going to add this over now to the other side, because now we're going to start solving. So I'm going to add that b squared minus 4ac over to the other side. And then I need to divide this a off. Dividing by a is the same as multiplying by 1 over a. So if it's 1 over a, I just get 4a squared in the denominator. And then I square root both sides. So I get the plus or minus because I square rooted both sides. I have the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator. Now, the square root of 4 is just 2, and the square root of a squared is just a. So when I subtract that uh, b over 2a over to the other side, I have this. And since I have a common denominator, I can just write this all as one big fraction. So there's my solution for x. Do any of you guys recognize this formula? Yeah, you probably learned this in Algebra 1. This is called the quadratic formula. So we say for ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. And we call this the quadratic formula. So this, I'd expect you to know, not the process that we used to get it, 
but I wanted to point out that the process that we used was just two things that we already knew how to do. We just applied them in a general setting and the algebra got a little bit, you know, there's a lot of stuff to keep track of. Looked like an alphabet soup there for a minute. But that's all it is. We just used two techniques that we're okay doing with on, you know, if A, B, and C were just numbers. So let's say that we had this x squared, what was it again that we started with back here? Oops. 6x minus 3. Okay. So I know here that a is 1, b, so x is equal to negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over a. So negative 6 plus or minus 6 squared is 36. 4 times 1 times negative 3 is negative 12. Minus a negative 12 is positive 12. Thirty-six plus twelve is forty-eight. And now the square root of forty-eight I can do a little bit better then, right? I recognize that forty-eight is the same thing as sixteen times three. And the square root of sixteen is just four. And then I can think about this then as two separate fractions. So negative three divided by two is, or sorry, negative six divided by two is negative three. Four divided by two is just two. That root three just hangs out. Here's my final answer, which is exactly the same answer that we got before. And we're done. So the big takeaway here, this quadratic formula, the first solving technique that works for any standard form polynomial, right? If it's in standard form, I can use this technique on it to solve it. Now, is it faster than factoring if the factoring can be done with a shortcut? I don't really think so. In those situations, I'd still rather factor. But in this cases where maybe I can't use a shortcut or it doesn't appear that it's factorable, this is a nice option, right? Okay, so we're done for today. This is as much as I want to do. Um, if you check back later today, I'll have an assignment in the content library for you. I don't have it finished quite yet but it'll be practicing using some of these solving techniques that we've talked about today. Please be careful um, and read the directions carefully on the homework because I'll ask you to do the solving a certain way, whether it's using the reverse order of operations or the quadratic formula or factoring or whatever. Um, I'm gonna give you or problems that I want you to do a certain way. When it comes time for the test, There'll probably be some problems that I ask you to just solve using whatever method you find appropriate because it is important that you're able to pick and choose the appropriate method to make your life as easy as possible, right? Let's do things the fastest way that we can. Um, but we do need to practice all of these techniques at some point, and that's what I'm going to ask you to do in some of these subsequent homework assignments. Any questions for me at this point? Okay, well, I'm done. So thank you guys. You did a nice job today. And uh, don't forget to check back later for the homework assignment.